It is the end of the world as we know it. Or is it? Will we survive at all? Is it the extinction level event that some in power fear that it is? 1998, Tia Leone, Morgan Freeman, Lili Sobieski. This is Deep Impact. Every now and then, rival studios put out films that seem to follow a theme. You get things like The Abyss, Leviathan, Deep Star 6, all these undersea adventures or underwater monsters. Every now and then it's sharks. Every now and then it's storms. In 1998, it was asteroids hurtling towards the Earth to wipe out civilization. Armageddon, starring Bruce Willis and a plethora of others, was out in theaters, but also at the same year, Deep Impact. I reviewed Armageddon elsewhere, but it's worth noting for purposes of contrast. Armageddon took the concept of an asteroid hurtling towards Earth and our imminent extinction and tried to fit in a Bruce Willis action film. Plenty of shooting when they get to the asteroid, though there's no real antagonist. The antagonist is the asteroid, and it just doesn't flow. There's a lot of stuff in Armageddon to love. There's a lot in it that's really ridiculous. Deep Impact went the opposite direction. I very much prefer the film Deep Impact. There's an ensemble cast. There's no action hero. There's no specific protagonist. There are several different aspects of the story unfolding that we get to witness. And the only antagonist really is the asteroid. Though there are humans that have some difficult relationships with each other. And there's a lot of existential angst. The film is not about good and evil, good guy, bad guy. It does not play out. Rather, it is how human beings face the possibility of their extinction. The ones that rise above and shine in these heroic moments. The ones that do degenerate things and freak out. And how would we manage such a crisis? Now, it's actually arguable which one of these films is less realistic. Because eh, the race is on. When you have an asteroid hurtling towards Earth, the idea that we would be able to know that it was coming, certainly know with enough advanced knowledge that the government has been secretly preparing, to know to enough mathematical certainty that it made it worthwhile for the government to spend gazillions of dollars they don't have to prepare, and then what if it misses you? The idea that this thing moving, though while in space, it looks like it is going slow at this extreme distance. The idea that we would send a ship to intercept it when it's heading toward it. The physics of this is sort of very, well, I'm not enough of a physicist. My, my mind in practical terms says you can possibly, and we've had probe satellites in that at, in the trail of a comet or approaching things that are orbiting with predictable trajectories, but things shooting through space. Uh, honestly, it feels much too optimistic, as bad as it can be in the universe of the film, Deep Impact. It seems way too optimistic that we would even know it was coming. But there are several responses that the governments of Earth, beginning with America, take that are very insightful and interesting and really what really makes the plot compelling are these human stories of what would we do, what would be the smart thing to do in any sort of like disaster, anything with enough forewarning, how would we deal with it? The fact that the government deals with it in phases, sending astronauts into space to try to blow up the asteroid, preparing a barrage of missiles nuclear armed as the, as the asteroid gets closer should that first mission fail having, encouraging people to use bunkers, their basements, whatever, to try to survive, but specifically using hollowed out old sort of Cold War deep underground facilities and expanding on those to put people in there to survive the catastrophe so the human race does not become extinct. It makes sense. It's multi-tiered, though flying at it to blow it up is kind of, I don't know the physics of that, but having multiple a multi-tiered plan for how to survive, accounting for, let's try this, let's try this, try the thing that, you know, this, that we can try at this phase, at this phase, 
until we just hunker down and wait it out and, and try to reclaim the surface later. That's a very rational way of doing it. And despite the fact that I think most of the people in power and our governments are, are, are crazy, dumb, or uh, just front people for behind the scenes, there are people behind the scenes or who have the resources that they would do something to protect themselves and their own well-being. If it looked like that or not, uh, the way it does in the film, we don't know. Hopefully I never have to find out. We never have to find out. But through the eyes of Jenny Lerner, she is a reporter, investigative journalist. She uncovers, thinking that she's investigating a member of the cabinet who had an affair, possibly, and quit the cabinet, finds out about Ellie, finds out that Ellie is actually the ELE, the Extinction Level Event. She keeps her silence for patriotic reasons until she can be called upon by President Morgan Freeman, not his name in the movie. President Morgan Freeman calls on her and the truth comes out. They do several things that are very compellingly interesting. The multi-phase plan to try to save humanity, which at each, you know, when you're going to bunker people in a bunker and let the rest of the world go extinct, there's got to be some way to keep people from becoming unhinged. They deal with it very smart. If you can keep a million people in a bunker until the surface is reclaimable, why would you not just pre-select people that you need pre-select the people that you want. Of course, if you do that, the people that you do not pre-select have very little hope. Their entire hope has to be pinned on your ability to stop the asteroid, knowing that there is a final last ditch effort that involves for certain their death. Brilliantly, they pre-select a number of people that they need with specific uh, backgrounds and expertise, and within a certain age range, however, allowing for reproduction, they then hold a lottery for the remaining people. So logically, if we were going to be Mr. Spock, we'd say, that's not a lot of people. A million people pre-select everybody and make sure you've got what you need, but it's very smart to leave it. So the people can hope for the mission in space. They can hope for the rocket barrage. They can hope to be in the lottery and still be saved. Down to the last very end before the asteroid hits, everybody still has a glimmer of hope. And that's what maintains control of civilization during this whole year or so that they are preparing the public for this catastrophe. The president freezing wages, freezing prices, to prevent gouging, preventing the, you know, an economic collapse, martial law, make sure everybody knows that crimes against persons and property will be dealt with most harshly, trying to keep people from freaking out. But they brilliantly do this with both the carrot and the stick. The stick is there, but there's several types of carrots that you might get and you might survive the catastrophe. And against this, we have a really nice series of human stories. Jenny Lerner going through the divorce of her, her father having divorced her mother, replaced her with a, uh, a woman younger than, than Jenny is. She's got a stepmother that's a couple years younger than her. That whole, in the midst of this crisis, dad is old, has this crisis of wanting a younger woman. He's going through this whole mortality. I don't want to say midlife because he's a little bit older than that. Um, he's going through this existential crisis, but in the big picture, the asteroid's coming and the world's going to come to an end, and they don't even know it. And his first wife, Jenny's mother, ends up abandoned and alone, having to face this. It's sort of that thing of, what are, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing today that if it turned out to be your last day on Earth, would you be doing different? You know, like he, they're making these plans, they're doing these things. He's got a younger wife. What's going to happen with their future? It doesn't matter. The asteroid is going to decide that ultimately his wife ends up leaving him because she's scared because people of a certain age will not be in the lottery and only some of them will be pre-selected if they have a special skill. So as we see the, the young people in the story, the high school kids who first spot the thing in space at the beginning, there's this weird turn of events where uh, the boy in, in love with Lily Sobieski's character, or has a crush on her, um, ultimately comes to her, and, and the worst marriage proposal in all cinematic history 
comes with a ring and says, this is your only chance to survive, essentially, because he was pre-selected for discovering the asteroid was on its way. He's going to marry her, and then her and her family can go. But of course, at the last second, finding out that included her, but not her family. Could she leave her family? Her pregnant mom, who ends up delivering during the course of this year, not knowing if the world is coming to an end, it deals with what humans would be suffering at that time. But Deep Impact really is giving us a clue as to life dealing with our own mortality. Oh, we never know. We never know whether tomorrow is our last day or this evening. We never know whether something's hurtling from space. We never know if something is just about to break loose and lodge in our brain somewhere. We, we don't know. We go through our lives as though that's not going to happen. But when faced with this outside external existential threat, then suddenly life becomes all about reanalyzing my life, my choices, and where I'm going in view of this threat that's on its way, forgetting that that threat is always on its way. And the really beautiful thing, too, about the way the film ends is blowing up the asteroid, splitting it into two parts, Right? They give you the happy ending without the happy ending. You don't have to go to the bunker and leave everyone else on the surface, but lots of people die. One part of the asteroid survives. It does strike the Earth. Everything gets flooded. There's this really nasty global catastrophe, but it is not extinction. Astronauts heroically giving their lives to blow up the asteroid to do what damage they could. And it ends up being that this is deep impact. It's a great story through the eyes of all these people, their lives, their choices, the human spirit rising to the occasion. But there's a lot of folks that did not like it because there isn't a lot of antagonism. There's not even like a Dr. Smith on Lost in Space character. There's really not. You, you kind of don't like Jenny's dad, but he ain't evil. And then that kind of works itself out. And it's just other than the outside threat, there's no real... There's no political fight over the agenda. There's no political fight over what they're going to do. There's no sort of last minute conspiracy, which they do work out for Armageddon's version of, you know, how to blow up the thing. And so it ends up, it could be perceived as rather dull, but it's really insightful as to the life and how they face surviving or not surviving of these various protagonists in different stations of life, different backgrounds, different people as they confront this together. And it ends up being, despite all the catastrophe and stress, a very feel-good movie, you know, about people pulling together and all of that, which was a, a lot more palatable in the late 90s than I think it would be now. I mean, now it would be, well, if they even could make anything remotely this good, again, it would feel forced and it would feel like it was really about contemporary politics uh, once again, which it didn't so much feel like that in 98. There's a little twinge of it what with the media and the president, but it's not really all that even, even noticeable or out there. So of, of the two films, I have watched Armageddon a number of times. The music is great in Armageddon. There's a lot to enjoy in it that's entertaining. But for quality of film, for quality of statement, for the quality of, of what they're trying to say philosophically through this, I definitely, that's the one, the one I've watched over and over and over again has been Deep Impact. I just, I think it's fabulously well done. So let me know what you think, and we'll see you next time. Peace and long life without an asteroid, maybe.